Anamedlerdeyiz. Zero, welcome to Anamed Library Talks. At today's talk, we have four distinguished speakers with us. Cemal Kafadar, Gülrün Ecipoğlu, Cornel Flesher and Tülay Artan. Today's talk is entitled Treasures of Knowledge, an Inventory of the Ottoman Place Library. In this talk, the three speakers will discuss their jointly edited publication on an inventory of manuscripts kept in the book treasury of the Topkapı Palace in Istanbul. This unique inventory was commissioned by the Ottoman Sultan Bayezid II from his royal librarian Atufi in the year 9008. 908, I'm sorry, and was transcribed in a clean copy in 909. The inventory is preserved in the Oriental Collection of the Library of the Hungarian Academy of Sciences. It records over 5,000 volumes and more than 7,000 titles on virtually every branch of human erudition at the time. At this point, I would like to introduce you our speakers. Cemal Kafadar is Professor of History and the Vehbi Koç Professor of Turkish Studies in the History Department at Harvard University. Among his publications are Between Two Worlds, The Construction of the Ottoman State, a volume of essays on four, four ordinary lives and on autobiographical writing in Turkish to, to <clears throat> 2011, and a room of one's own reflection on cultural geography and identity in the lens of Rome. <clears throat> I'm sorry. He has also edited with Halil Alcik, Süleyman II and his time. Gülür Necipoğlu has been the Ag Agahan professor and director of Agahan program for Islamic art at Harvard University since 1993. She received her Harvard PhD in 1986 and specialized in the arts, architecture of Mediterranean and Eastern Islamic lands. Her publications focus on aesthetics, cosmopolitanism, transregional regional connectivity between early modern empires, architectural practice and drawings, aesthetics of ge ge ge geometric abstraction, theories of ornament, and the historiography of modern construction of the field of Islamic art architecture. Cornel Flesher grew up, grew up in Cairo, Baghdad, Bonn, and California, and earned a BA, MA, and PhD from the Department of, Department of Near Eastern Studies at Princeton University. He taught Persian, Turkish, and Arabic at the Ohio State University, Islamic and Middle Eastern History at Washington University in St. Louis, and is currently the Carnegie Suleiman Professor of Ottoman and Modern Turkish Studies, the University of Chicago. He is a 1988 MacArthur Prize Fellowship winner. In 1986, Princeton University Press published Procrat and Intellectual in the Ottoman Empire, the historian Mustafa Ali. Our moderator of this talk is Tülay Artan. Her interests include prosopographic studies of the Ottoman elite and their households, material culture, consumption history, and standards of living, 17th, 18th century Ottoman and Middle Eastern history, arts, architecture, and manuscript culture in comparative perspective. Her recent publications, Painter, Patrons, Women in Distress, The Changing Fortunes of Nevzade Atayi, and Uskubi Pir Mehmet Efendi in early 18th century Istanbul, Şeyh Ali Paşa'nın Şuke Sultan'da satılan kitapları, sahaflar ve koleksiyonerler, İslami ilimler alanında yazma kitap piyasası ve 18. yüzyıl koleksiyonlarının inşası, Osmanlı kitap koleksiyonları ve koleksiyonerleri, Imaginary Voyages, Imagined Ottomans, A Gentleman Impostor, The Köprülüs and 17th Century French Oriental Romances, The First Hesten Steps of Ottoman Protocol and Diplomacy into Modernity. Birinci Mahmut döneminde Boğaziçi, Temaşa, Tefekkür, Tavafuk ve Şehri Sefa, Gölgelenen Sultan, Uluntular Yıllar, Birinci Mahmut ve Dönemi. Also, Horse Racing at the Ottoman Court, 18. yüzyıl başında Osmanlı bilgi üretimi ve dağılımı, yazma eser koleksiyonları ve koleksiyonlar arasında Şehit Ali Paşa'nın yeri. 
Dear attendees, please bear in mind that your video and audios are closed. Uh, please type your questions in the chat, chat section. Uh, your questions will be answered in the Q&A session. Now I'm passing the word to Tilay Artan. Thank you for your participation. Hello and good evening. Uh, greetings from Istanbul. Uh, welcome to the Anamed Library Talks and the last session of 2022. Thank you to the Koç University Library of the Research Center for Anatolian Civilizations for organizing this session on the 2019 publication of a milestone in Ottoman studies, Treasures of Knowledge, an inventory of the Ottoman Palace Library, 1502-1504. Thank you for the invitation and kind introduction. I'm privileged to be here today with the editors of these two most inspiring monumental volumes, my friends Gülru Cemal and Cornell, and to hear them discuss their Gargantian project, its intellectual direction, and its end product, which struck a new path in the literature of many fields in history, including history of ideas, history of writing and reading, history of science, history of libraries, library studies, manuscript studies, arts of the book, Ottoman history, the early, late 15th and early 16th century, and many more. Um, welcome, Guru and Jemal, and thank you for being here uh, so soon after setting foot in Istanbul. And thank you, Cornell, for joining us from Chicago in the very early morning hours. All my sympathies. Uh, the Treasures of Knowledge came out in 2019 just five years after the Harvard University workshop on the Ottoman Palace Library Inventory, where most of the contributors of the book first gathered together in April 2014. In mere chronological terms, this is a huge accomplishment for any edited volume, but this is not any ordinary edition. Although I've personally witnessed in earlier occasions, their conversations revolving around out of his catalog, I'm still in a wondering how Gilru, Jamal, and Cornell came up with the idea, what they aim to achieve, and the whole process of putting the volumes together. Answers to such questions can be found in these two volumes, consisting of 28 essays and five appendices together with the transliteration of the inventory and its facsimile. Here today, the three editors, also the authors of the first three essays, will give a brief overview on their individual contributions to the volume, on the implications of this unique library inventory, <laughs> contents of the book and its goals. After each speaker's presentation, I will get the conversation started as we proceed to the Q&A. Without further ado, I would like to leave the floor to Gülru. Please, Gülru, Buyurun. Thank you, thank you, Gülay. Uh, I really appreciate this uh, opportunity to introduce uh, our co-edited book through our own contributions. Uh, so my presentation uh, today is titled The Spatial Organization of Knowledge in the Ottoman Palace Library, an encyclopedic collection and its inventory. Uh, so uh, as in my uh, book essay, I shall focus on the organization system of this inventory of books, uh, which were collected at the uh, inner treasury uh, and the room hazinesi, known today as uh, Hazine Dairesi or uh, Fatih Köşkü in the top of the palace. That building 
was one of the first uh, in the palace complex that uh, Fatih Mehmed II built in the 1460s. Uh, so that the building is shown on our uh, the poster of the program, that building. Uh, this royal book collection was shaped under two successive sultans, uh, started by Mehmed II and followed by his son, Mehmed Bayezid II. It was the latter sultan who commissioned the inventory from his royal library, Atufi, in 1502, uh, 1503, and it was completed uh, the following year. And it is that completed version, uh, which is the only remaining uh, copy uh, that we use uh, from the Hungarian uh, library. The inventory is titled Defteri Kütük. Uh, the, the, by the way, uh, I will mostly pronounce in the Ottoman Turkish manner because the text is both in Arabic and in Turkish. Uh, most of it is in Arabic. So it records uh, over 5,700 volumes and more than 7,000 titles. The fields of knowledge classified in this fascinating document are more numerous than the ones that are typically found in catalogs or inventories of madrasa libraries. For instance, the library uh, um, catalog of Mehmed II's most complex in, in the Fatih district in Istanbul, uh, lists much fewer uh, fields of knowledge. Moreover, the Sultan only donated 800 books for this uh, collection uh, to which others scholars and the public contributed. Whereas the palace library was only uh, the collection of the Sultans. Uh, to give you a sense, the contemporaneous library of the King of Hungary, uh, Matthias Corvinus, uh, also had a palace library, very famous, and it was the largest in Europe at that time. It featured only 2,500 volumes, almost half as many as Bayezid VII's and Bayezid II's palace library. Uh, the Vatican had about 1,000 books, so uh, you can really see how, how many more. Uh, and if we count the individual titles, uh, there are 7,000. Uh, the inventory compiled by Atufi is in Arabic, but it features a, a very interesting uh, Turkish preface which explains the librarian's methods of classification. He calls himself, quote, the weakest slave of El Atufi, the keeper of books at the imperial treasury of Sultan Bayezid Han, namely El Hadim uh, El Kituk, El Hizaniti El Amire, Lil Sultan Bayezid Haniye. His shorter Arabic preface explains what Sultan Bayezid ordered to him. I'm quoting. To determine the titles of the books in the imperial uh, treasury, Hizanid al-Amire, and to classify every book according to its particular discipline, Fen. Writing this information, on the front page and on the binding of every book. And then he commanded me to write this in the present register, uh, inventory, in a way that corresponds exactly to the titles and descriptions that are written on the front pages and the bindings without altering it, these in any way. So this is a very kind of specific uh, uh, order, and it shows uh, that Atufi had to first review all the books that, that were collected, determine and write the titles as well as the disciplines, the fan, uh, in front, in the front page, and in the bindings of the books. Indeed, we find these uh, in very many 
uh, books that are currently present in the top Topkapu Library. Uh, in the bindings, uh, in the back, uh, on the spine, uh, an etiquette was uh, pasted. Uh, sometimes uh, these etiquettes fell down, but in those cases, we only find the name in the first page. Uh, uh, uh, Atufi's longer Turkish preface at the end of the inventory is titled Kanun el Defter. It outlines the rules adopted in the classification of classification process. The first rule is that books listed under specific disciplines in the inventory must be grouped together in specific library depositories, Mahzen, which were dedicated to each of these disciplines. In other words, the subject catalog clearly corresponds to and reflects the spatial organization of the book containers in the library. These were probably built in wall niches that still exist in the Enderun Hazinesi, known as Hazine Dairesi, where the walls have many niches, uh, which may have also uh, displayed some treasured items. An exception to this rule was books falling under multiple titles and disciplines. Atufi classified these uh, multi-title books according to the science from which they might more likely be requested. İstenmek ihtimali olan. In fact, the palace library was not merely uh, restricted to the sultan, but also uh, could be used by the palace residents. Moreover, privileged non-residence members of the court also had occasional ad, uh, access to the library, according to 16th century uh, registers. These registers record the persons who checked out the palace uh, library book. So, uh, and unfortunately, they have not yet been studied and uh, they could show the patterns of readership among different groups of people and which books were most popular. So they are waiting uh, for scholars uh, to um, uh, study them. Interestingly, Atufi applied a different rule to books on poetry. These are grouped according to language rather than subject matter, namely Arabic, Persian, Turkish, and what he calls Mogoliya, which we, did, we think is Chaatai Turkish. Another rule is that book titles must be recorded exactly as they are written on the binding or flyleaf on the manuscript, even if the title is incomplete or grammatically wrong. That is very interesting. And it's, it, it's a curious rule that confirms what Sultan ordered, namely to write things uh, exactly without any change. Now, it implies, in my opinion, that the catalog was also used for identifying specific volumes during the periodic inventory checks of the treasury, which were also done for the objects that uh, both Tulai and I uh, have been studying those uh, inventories of treasury objects in the same building. Uh, the inventory of Atufi also helped to rapidly locate a book upon demand by a reader. It also indicates that the readers could consult the catalog to know what was available in the library as we do today. Atufi's last section is on rules of the book depository. Here he explains that disciplines listed in the inventory's table of contents, Fihris, must be copied onto labels pasted on the individual book repositories. The library therefore had a topographic dimension as did medieval royal counterparts. In other words, the, there was a label uh, pasted on, the, uh, on each shelf or niche. For instance, the semi-public gigantic Fatimid Palace 
library in Cairo, which featured books in all domains of knowledge, had multi-layered wall niches, each niche with a label identifying the particular discipline. I'm sure that the librarian must have read descriptions of earlier historical libraries, such as those of the uh, Sultans in Cordoba uh, and the like. Also about that. According to Atufi, uh, the Sultan ordered him to catalog the Royal Library because of his particular devotion to books on the sciences of religion. So this, is, this comes at the very beginning of his explanation. So Bayezid is in, interested in the sciences of, of religion, and that's why he ordered the cataloging. However, um, uh, uh, probably that's not the only reason, because there's an astounding number of disciplines in the catalog inventory. Otherwise, he could have just like cataloged the religious ones and left them uncatalogued. No, that was not Bayezid's intention. It's customary. The hierarchical ordering of the discipline, disciplines in the catalog do begin with theology and jurisprudence. So now I'm going to read you the more than 20 uh, fields of knowledge or fans uh, that are cataloged uh, in the inventory. Uh, for, uh, after the books on theology and jurisprudence follows saints, lives, and Sufism ethics, medicine and agriculture, biography and history. And history is the longest category. It has several subcategories on uh, called kingship, politics, horsemanship, houndsmanship, falconry, wonders of creation, and cosmography, geography. So those all enter under uh, biography and history. Then follow uh, grammar and literature, the mathematical sciences, logic, philosophy, and translations of the Torah, Psalms, and the Bible. The MS Turek, which we uh, call this uh, library, uh, this inventory after the Hungarian library, uh, MS Turek, uh, therefore, uh, combines both religious and uh, rational uh, sciences in the manner of a universal collection. Atufi's book depository rules specify that the deluxe manuscripts, nefayis, uh, should be uh, in each discipline were uh, placed in separate depositories and were separate from the ordinary books, guide I Well, my other eyeglass, <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, this is better. Okay. The, the luxury book depositories were labeled as such. The stated purpose of this rule was to avoid mixing up luxurious and ordinary books when all the books were periodically taken out from the library and placed under the sunlight to avoid mildew. So on these occasions, according to Atufi, Islamic books, Kutubu Islami, had to be treated very respectfully, uh, unlike the other books. So. Uh, there is a kind of religious decorum involved. High status deluxe books indicate that aesthetic concerns were equally important as the subject matter of books. Indeed, to, today there are so many uh, uh, beautifully illustrated books that still reflect that preference. However, uh, the only manuscripts that Atufi describes uh, physically are the Quran manuscripts, which occupy the first position uh, in, the, uh, in the inventory. They are cited with reference to size, paper type, and sometimes their calligraphers. Uh, curiously, nearly 10 books are identified as illustrated, Musavar, 
Now, this is strange because many of the, uh, not only the artistic books, but also uh, those uh, on poetry and so on are, uh, that we know are in the uh, collection are illustrated. I think this is because uh, the inventory records only the titles written on the first pages and the bindings of books, which are really abbreviated. Therefore, uh, whether they were illustrated or not is usually not uh, part of these identifications. Moreover, Bayezid ordered the first and last pages of all manuscripts, whether he collected them or not, to be stamped with his own seal. Therefore, comparing the book titles in Atufi's in inventory with titles written on existing manuscripts that are stamped with Bayezid's seal has allowed our group to identify hundreds of manuscripts listed in the inventory. In fact, uh, there's an exact match between the catalog listings and the titles listed on the first pages and bindings of those manuscripts. So, uh, I mean, in a way you might say, why does it matter? It does matter because it shows which book was the exact book that, that was mentioned. Um, and, and especially for uh, uh, bookworms like us, <laughs> this, this matters a lot. Who held the book? <laughs> okay, so uh, the inventory challenges the assumption that interest in such diverse fields of knowledge had disappeared in the post-medieval era. This inventory also demonstrates that the book collection uh, catalogued in it was not pri uh, primarily pillaged as war booty, as is sometimes assumed. For example, uh, Bezid's successor, Selim I's subsequent conquests in Mamluk, Syria, Egypt, and Safavid, Iran, did bring an influx of plundered books into the palace library. However, Atufi's inventory was compiled a decade before the Chaldiran victory in Iran. This shows that the numerous books from post-Mongol Iran and Central Asia, both in Persian and Chagatai Turkish, had already been gathered in the Ottoman Palace Library alongside uh, Arabic works. Selim, Selim's treasury uh, collection inventories, uh, uh, as I studied uh, the uh, Enderun Hazinesi Defterleri, there the books are not usually mentioned except for over 100 foreign language books uh, copied uh, uh, without mentioning their titles. So there are over 100 books uh, that are um, defined as Imrani, which we, which I uh, see as cultural uh, books in multiple titles. So these were like the Mehmed II's famous collection of books in Greek, Latin, Italian, Hebrew, Armenian, Syrian, and Serbian, because it says foreign languages. Interestingly, these books have been categorized as treasury items, and were not incorporated into Bayezid's library inventory, which exclusively comprises books in Islamic languages. Atufi's uh, deviations from standard classifications of knowledge were con conditioned by the personal orientations of Mehmed II and Bayezid II. In other words, the collection and its collectors were inseparable. Some books in the uh, inventory can be attributed to many of the second's interests, particularly the Arabic translations of Greek, Latin, and Syriac texts known to have been commissioned by him. Fascinating translations possibly made for him include two unknown books. One, one of them is called A Treatise on the City of Florence. The other one is called Book on the City of the Venetians and its Mode of Government. Interesting, maybe one day it will, these will be discovered. The numerous bilingual, trilingual, and even quadrilingual dictionaries listed in Atufi's 
inventory, I mean, it's mind boggling the number of dictionaries, could partly have been related to this and other translation projects. The inventory ends with translations of the Bible, Psalms and David's, the uh, Psalms of David and the Torah, which are indeed mentioned in a work by Mehmed II's protege Amirut says. Uh, and he mentions that these texts were consulted during an interconfessional dialogue in the Sultan's court. Uh, so now I turn to my last paragraphs. Uh, according to the Venetian uh, bylaw, uh, Andrea Gritti's Relazione of 1503, exactly the year when the uh, inventory was compiled, Although Beyazut's interest extended to poetry, philosophy, and theology, he was actually mostly interested about astrology, cosmography, and mechanical sciences. And indeed, these fields are very heavily uh, collected, as probably uh, Jemai uh, will mention in his talk. The extremely rich section uh, on the literary sciences and poetry also captures the emergence of a newly flourishing tradition of Turkish poetry under Bayezid, although because unlike his father, he did not overtly privilege uh, immigrant Persian poets and literati. But still the uh, Turkish poetry section is much shorter than the Persian and the Arabic ones. This trilingualism was diminished in the mid 16th century by the rising dominance of Ottoman Turkish uh, as the preferred uh, language of bureaucracy. In conclusion, MS Turek is an astounding archive that reveals the horizons and epistemological frameworks of Ottoman uh, culture at all levels, including the collection and production of books. It helps us map out an intellectual landscape. This was surely a culture of books that were collected, copied, and consulted, rather than locked up in the treasury and forgotten. In fact, the fact that we still use these books is a testimony to their continuing agency. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Oak. July, <clears throat> thank you. I too would like to start thanking Iram Hanım and Anna Med and Tulay, of course, for taking on this role, our dear colleague, and um, all the colleagues who participated and in and contributed to our volume, and above all to Cornell and Gülru, my co conspirators. Um, I too worked on different specific aspects of the books and codicology and whatnot, though Gilru gave such a good summary of this, and in her piece in the book, she also puts it all in a very developed spatial framework of the palace. Uh, I thought of my role in the essay beyond the specific critical work and everything uh, as one whereby I would focus on the specific context of the time more or less not just that one year but of the time frame in which this uh, unique and precious document was put together and in doing that I uh, like many of my colleagues I was acting with the awareness that we work in this field of Ottoman studies with at least two teleologies. It's like a chifte kavrulmuş teleology, a double roasted teleology of one, our modernist perspective, and the other, the very narrative of Ottoman historiography itself. And I'm sure Cornell will say much more and much more eloquently about these. I wanted to evaluate this unique and precious document with that awareness and reassess Bayezid, the roles of Bayezid, Amasya, and the decade or 
two preceding children, all of which, because of the teleology, the progression-minded order of Ottoman historiography has, I think, come under, under, under shadows that occlude a proper understanding. So Bayezid has come under the shadow of his father and his son, two major figures, two heroes, giants of the progression of Ottoman expansion. And Amasya has come under the shadow of Bursa and Edirne, because Istanbul is the ultimate and Bursa and Edirne lead to Istanbul in that framework, I mean, not necessarily in and of itself. And, and the first decade of the 16th century in particular leads to the do or die confrontation with Shah Ismail and Chaldran in the Ottomanist and Ottoman historiographic narrative. But I'm not so, so sure that that, that, that that particular decade and the reign of Bayezid should be seen in that light. So, and, and our volume appeared a couple of months before the pandemic. So we could not really do any proper book launch events, but one, fortunately in New Orleans in the fall of 2019, which is the last time uh, we, the three of us came together in person. And since then we were unable, today is the opportunity. So I'll also treat it somewhat like a book reading. But with that introductory framework in mind of working against two teleologies and reassessing, trying to, hoping to reassess the roles of Bayezid and Amasya and the first decade of the 16th century and a bit more. Unlike his father and his son, Sultan Bayezid was more interested in peaceful and orderly administration than in conquest. He thus worked harder on manufacturing consent than on wielding coercion. Many contemporaries described him as unwarlike and moderate. The Crimean Khan, for instance, an Ottoman vassal since 1475, asked the Sultan in a surprisingly forward letter if the duty of jihad was no longer in force now that the Ottoman army had remained inactive for some time. Why is it response to that properly? <laughs> but later historians also, such as Hammer, Josef von Hammer Purkstar, uh, describes, wrote that Bayezid did not engage in war unless he had to. That is an early 19th century assessment. The difference in temperament between Bayezid and his father also struck contemporaries of theirs who knew them both. For instance, Tursun Beg, who knew them both indeed, historian and scribe of the late 15th century, wrote critically that the wrath of Mehmed II trumped his moderation. Gazab and Hilm are the technical terms here, implying the reverse for his son Bayezid. That reputation seems to have run, rendered Bayezid a figure of lesser significance and accomplishment in the eyes of posterity, particularly in modern historiography, which tends to either ignore him or present him in a defensive posture, which only reinforces that image. Oh, he wasn't that bad. Oh, he wasn't that inactive. Oh, he really did engage in some warfare and success, etc. In terms of his record as a patron of the arts and culture too, Bayezid's legacy remains captive to two dominant narratives. On the one hand, his reign falls between the fabled patronage of his father and the felicitous partnership of his grandson, Suleiman, with the great architect Sinan, on the other hand, at least since the late 19th century, when intellectuals around the world started to ask why their country was not like Europe and adopted defensive positions vis-a-vis -vis European civilization, European civilization, Bayezid's victory over his brother Jem to consolidate control of the Ottoman Sultanate has come to represent a path not taken, the ultimate what if of Ottoman history. In his counterfactual account, Mehmed knew, in this counterfactual account, Mehmed knew what the Renaissance was all about. And Jem would have continued in that path to lead his empire toward modernity. What if, therefore, easily turns into a wishful, if only, 
if only Jem had succeeded. And those of you who know something about early modern Indian history, South Asian history, this is the same Aurangzeb Darashiko story, what if or if only. Anyway, the reason why is reverse some of his father's policies was not, was not simply a matter of temperament, of course. We know that some of Mehmed's policies were deemed to be unsustainable, such as, such as his policy of confiscations of more than 20,000, according to Tursun Bey, of villages that had been endowed to turn them into thieves. Various other policies of his, by the end of his reign, Mehmed II had created large numbers of resentful subjects due to various policies which were considered harsh and even tyrannical in the voice of, for instance, the anonymous chronicles. Um, at least some of that material about uh, critical material on by is it the first and Mehmed II either discreetly or explicitly and even loudly gave vent to a critical sensibility vis-a-vis -vis Ottoman centralization in the emerging corpus toward the, in the final two decades of the 16th, 15th century that we now call the early Ottoman chronicles. The emerging corpus represented a systematic engagement with oral traditions, as well as some sparse early written materials based on those traditions, followed by editions in written form. Here we have the first substantive textual layer of public debate in Ottoman cultural life. That is the last 15 years or so of the 15th century, before the inventory leading up to that moment. This body of chronicles was only part of an avalanche of efforts toward textualizing the oral narratives and traditions of Turkish speakers in the 15th century, a process of what I've called textualization, whereby, for instance, the epics of the early frontier era, Battalname, Danishmentname, Saltukname, were put into writing for the first time. The rich oral traditions of the Oguz is embodied in epic narrative cycles or um, edifying and entertaining common discursive genres like proverbs were also collected and edited in this period. Bayezid's patronage sometimes touched these, sometimes it was simply a matter of his times. As for his patronage, directly speaking, his uh, patronage of certain dervish communities, his close links with Halveti Sheikhs, uh, are quite well known. And another aspect of his reign that this process of textualization embodies, uh, I identified, tried to call and um, articulate as Oguzism, Oguzjuluk, uh, spirited engagement with the political and cultural traditions of Old Turks. And this was not specific to Bayezid, of course, his brother Jem was likewise interested in this material. He's the one who had Saltukname uh, compiled, and he named one of his sons, Jem did, in other words, named one of his sons Oz, and Bayezid named one of his sons Korkut, and one of his daughters Ilaldi. By that time, these kinds of uh, Turkic names based on the inner Asian traditions were not prevalent among the Ottoman, within the Ottoman dynasty. That is uh, mid 15th uh, to late 15th century. But these two characters, Jem and Bayezid both were quite keen on making use of these. Da -di -da -di -da. <laughs> so textualization was a form of engagement with Oguzism among other things and even a defense of it at some level, but came at the expense of anchoring the tradition in new terrain where the written word would have hierarchical claims over the spoken. Bayezid directly had not much to do with this larger body of Oguzism, except for a few meaningful instances, such as the names of his children. But the most important, though not necessarily direct contribution of the Turkish and Turkmen led courtly societies of the 15th century to the textualization of oral epic narratives and related genres must be located in their overall valorization of the written word, 
which is what the palace inventory, among other things, exemplifies, embodies even, namely an overall valorization of the written word and their efforts to create hospitable environments for bookish and literary pursuits, including libraries. The textual turn was not an orchestrated event, nor was its main focus on the Turkish language as such, though it may have been the main beneficiary in the long run, as Gülru indicated, the palace library has not so many Turkish books, but it is part of a beginning trend that will prevail in the 16th century when Turkish, Turkish um, items in the palace library will go from 5%, which is what we have in the inventory, to uh, half of the library by the end of the 16th century, impressionistically speaking, but definitely uh, much, much bigger than uh, the time of the inventory. Um, Bayezid was also different in terms of his cultural policies from his father's, what I would consider unsustainable uh, uh, decisions, such as um, exiling or alienating or marginalizing various uh, renowned intellectuals of his time, of the time of Mehmet II. And of those, the best example is Sinan Pasha, whom uh, Bayezid resuscitated immediately after his accession. His father, his mother wrote him a letter approving of this decision. And uh, Sinan Pasha then wrote some of the earliest major works in the Turkish vernacular of a spiritual nature. And, and, his, and those three volumes were all written between 1481 and 1486 when Sinan Pasha died. Ma'arif name, Tazaru name, etc. And there are several other intellectuals one can mention who returned to the Ottoman lands after Mehmed's passing. By as its patronage does imply a different sort of era. Ah, for the city of Amasya, very briefly, the city of Amasya had been the princely residence of Bayezid II for more than a quarter century. Much like Bayezid himself, the significance of the city in Ottoman history has not been properly recognized because of what it was not. Bayezid was not his father. Amasya was not Edirne or Bursa. It was not a capital city. It never became an overture to Istanbul, nor was it a place that could be treated as a stage to the ultimate telos of Ottoman history. Amasya was, however, much more than just one princely city among others. Three of the four rulers of the 14th and 15th century came of age and cut their teeth in politics there. Both winners of the two bitterly fought internecine wars of that century, namely Mehmed I and Bayezid II, were Amasians for all practical purposes. The city would be at the, at the crux of the next big struggle among brothers, the sons of Bayezid II, which was this time lost by the Amasian, namely Ahmed, Prince Ahmed. And that period I would consider to be the second interregnum, actually 1511 to 1513, the legitimist narrative of Ottoman historiography tends to prefer to go from one legitimate ruler to another, even if there be bloodshed. It's just one after another. That is just the narrative, except for the post-Timurid recognized interregnum. Anyway, that's another discussion. Uh, for Amasya, I could say much more, but obviously it was the leading urban center of the easternmost region held continuously and securely by the Ottomans for more than a century. For more than a century, Amasya was the easternmost region. Expansion toward Erzincan, Divri came after in Selim's era. And Sivas and Tokat were part of the Amasya province. Amasya was also a veritable hub of commercial, cultural, and Sufi networks with extensive trans-regional connections. There were uh, notable families with deep roots in the ancient regime of the Seljuk and the Mongol eras. It was a site of considerable political capital for princes, and it was a place known for, for its merry company of socialites and literary elites. 
Uh, the city, obviously, because of all this, also obtained many um, migrants. But just to look at some of the re renowned figures, Mihri Hatun came from one of these Zade families. Mihri Hatun, one of the very few recognized female poets in the Ottoman high literary register uh, corpus. Uh, Müeyyed Zade is also by name Zade. Sheikh Hamdullah was of one of the Zades. Sabuncuoğlu Şerefettin's grandfather had been the palace physician for Mehmet I. The city, of course, also boasted of another tradition of learning, especially Armenian tradition of learning, of which another physician like Sabuncuoğlu Şerefettin, uh, Amir, Devlet, Am Am Emir Devlet Amas Yatsi, uh, was the renowned figure who wrote one of the most important pre-modern herbal compendia or herbal encyclopedias ever, which uh, was in Armenian, but with many counterparts given also in, uh, in old Anatolian Turkish. Anyway, administ the administrative peripheralization of Amasya after Bayezid's reign was due partly to a step taken by Selim, who, who demoted the city from its position as the capital of a province, a role which uh, Selim gave to Sivas after 1514-15. Amasya would again in the future gain that position, lose it again. It's a complicated story, but would never regain its status as the uncontested capital of uh, that region. Moreover, it was not uh, the easternmost region anymore where relations with Iran would be arbitrated. Uh, now, briefly, circa 1501, that moment of the first decade. By the way, even, <laughs> even beyond its role for the Ottoman order, Amasya region was also remembered a strong base for Turkmen communities that would reinvent themselves as Kızılbaş towards the end of the 15th century and can't present the biggest challenge to the Ottoman order. Numerous riots and instances of un unruliness in that vein had been recorded since the late, late 15th century, but full-fledged rebellions erupted only after Selim's departure from the region in 1515 and the one led by Sheikh Jalal in 1519 must have been in some sense paradigmatic since thereafter the word Jalali became the generic reference to rebels in the Anatolian countryside. So the significance of Amasya and I'm speaking of not just the city of the region should really be much, uh, loom much larger, I think, in the minds of Ottomanists, at least it does in mine ever since this study. As for the year 1501, it has come to imply to Ottoman historians as well as to modern scholars, the rise of the Safavid state. That is when Shah Ismail was crowned in Tabriz. Uh, the argument made by Selim and pro-Selim historiography to legitimate the prince's defiance of his father, namely that the older sultan was unaware of the magnitude of the Safavid threat and too soft in dealing with it, is by and large accepted by all later accounts. And surely there were apprehensions about the growing influence and ambitions of the Safavid order among the uh, Ottoman political elites starting in the final decades of the 15th century. Mehmed had already had some uh, sense of uh, Junaid being a headache. Already in Mehmed II's reign, in other words. But, uh, Two chronicles that happened to come to a halt in 1501 or two, namely one by Uruch and the other by Behishti, corroborate this picture of apprehension by providing a fascinating perspective on anxieties caused by the rising Safavid challenge, but without the sense of an inevitable military do or die clash as a necessary consequence. Moreover, the correspondence between Bayezid and Ismail during that decade indicate that Bayezid was regularly giving the message to Ismail that consent of the subject population, Raza, is the only way to legitimize and to success, uh, succeed 
in one's room. Uh, it is yet another instance of the tremendous hegemonic success of Ottoman historiography after Selim that Ottoman Safavid relations are described with Chaldran as the inevitable consequence of irreconcilable differences that set the course of those relations. More importantly, different sets of policies other than the one eventually designed and implemented by Selim were conceivable. Bayezid took some harsh measures by his own standards. If these efforts struck his son and successor Selim as feeble, this was perhaps because the Sultan was not bellicose enough for the hawks. And he typically moderated state violence with imperial patronage. But as its main policies in this regard were the following, to prevent the flight of the population out of Ottoman Asia Minor to Iran under the threat of execution and confiscation, to transport rebellious supporters of Erdebil, this is before the word Kızılbaş was regularly used, namely followers of the Safavid order to Moria, and to extend his patronage over the Bektashi cult of dervishes. Selim's policies would be, of course, very different from these. To view the context of Bayezid's Bayez cultural turn from another perspective, because remember that 1502, the year he commissioned the inventory, the writing of the inventory, came right after his only great military exploits against the Catholics. Between 1499 and 1501, he succeeded against Venice in the Adriatic and Southern Greek coastline, uh, Southwestern. And um, his earlier European campaign of 1484 was not against Catholic powers and did not register in the same way. Moreover, compared to Fatih Mehmed or earlier rulers, there had been a long period between 1484 and 1499 of inaction. So his victories in the Mediterranean and the Adriatic would be sealed in 1502 by means of two treaties signed with the Venetians and the Hungarians respectively. Already as the diplomatic negotiations were unfolding, Bayezid could change his pace and focus. The Hannibaldanus Chronicle, Oruç, both say that Selim uh, Bayezid spent the next year after 1501, the next couple of years in the capital, organizing the affairs of the empire. So the inventory came in that context. Uh, in July 1501, construction started on the mosque Madrasa complex in Istanbul that would be named after him, Bezat Jami, Bezat Kuliyesi. Within the same month, an order was sent to Manastir, North Macedonia, asking Mideris Ali Celebi to dispatch a book of history that his father was known to have compiled, namely a history of the House of Osman, in which, according to this Muhammad or Hukum, the tales of each dynast had been brought together. It does not appear to be coincidental that on the earliest surviving registers to systematize the procedures for the tenure clock of assistance, tenure clock in quotation marks, of assistance in madrasas also starts during the same month. And it is in 1502-03 that the Ihtisab Kanun Namileri of Bursa and Edirne organizing market life and along with it, the world of production that extends to cultural production were compiled. One final paragraph to put this in. In hindsight, Atufi's could arguably be considered the crowning achievement of an otherwise unstoried life. He wrote several other books, was known for them, had himself a biographical entry in Shekaik, but not many copies, not a big fame, and I would consider the Defteri Kutub to be his crowning achievement of an otherwise unstoried life. Just as in our own day, the labor of a librarian seems to have received less than its due. That's why I dedicated this piece to Rahmet Lefilis Hanım with all my heart, with all my respect for Filis Chama. Librarian seems to have received less than its due. He is remembered in all biographical accounts for his substantive works. 
which were considered respectable perhaps, but not much more than that. Yet a close reading of the unique book inventory Atufi prepared presents us with a remarkable and so far at least unparalleled intellectual endeavor. It would be seen as an early instance of the same early modern context with its qualitative and quantitative leap toward an archival order around rigorously structured practical documents that surveyed and counted and listed things and people on paper in tandem with a growing place for texts in the public sphere beyond that of holy texts. Thank you. I'll stop. Thank you so much. Um, so I'm going to start with the podcast. Uh, talk about uh, our. You don't. Can you hear me? Okay. Uh, now, yes. Yes, please. <clears throat> floor is yours. <clears throat> Thank you so much, Tudai. Uh, also, of course, great, great thanks to Irem <clears> Hanum, <throat> Chi Dem Hanum, uh, there for organizing this event and uh, at, at least virtually finally making it possible for Jamal uh, and Guru and myself to reunite, reunite uh, at least in two dimensions, uh, <laughs> after a hiatus uh, of of three years. I, I just. I'd like to, uh, and I will try to be brief in the interests of of time, also thank Gudro and Jamal for covering so much of the territory that uh, underlies uh, what I will try to be try to be expressing about the system of an understanding of the classification of sciences and the relationship of sciences to one another uh, <clears throat> that underlies uh, the whole work. Uh, in, to put it very, very succinctly, I suppose, uh, if not in too compact a, uh, a form, <clears throat> one, of the, one of the developments, one of the things that is, is so very useful and important about the temporal location of the inventory. Uh, as both of my friends and colleagues have noted, uh, is its intermediacy. Uh, that is, temporarily, it falls midway between, almost precisely midway between the physical assertion of empire with the conquest of Constantinople in 1453 uh, and then the emergence, indeed fluorescence, in uh, in and from the middle of the 16th century, uh, of a kind of it's very very much a a classicizing, uh, in a certain sense, an invention of tradition, uh, literary and and intellectual work whereby figures the likes of Taj Kiprizade, Celalzade Mustafa, uh, Ashik Celebi, uh, perhaps the latest among them at the end of the 16th century, in Mustafa Ali, <coughs> to construct a, a uh, an uh, Ottoman culture, which will be, as Jebal has alluded to, uh, really the basis for those rather teleological understandings uh, of the 19th and 20th centuries of what Ottoman is, uh, that is, again, teleologically, what Tashkipruzade or Ashuk Chelebi in the biographical spheres uh, have to say about what is Ottoman, it is projected all the way back to the, you know, the birth of the enterprise. So, so you know, the 14th century, uh, if you will. 
and so my point uh, of you know for this reason well i should say but these were two very different worlds okay? and there was nothing inevitable or indeed organic uh, about either the library itself okay it's not just an accumulation of physical objects uh, that have literary or si are seen to have literary or scientific value. It's a product of deliberate construction uh, and utilization, as Yudru has uh, so ably pointed out. The so anyway, I <laughs> I prefer rather than calling the inventory Ottoman because Ottoman is identified with those structures, intellectual structures and cultural structures uh, that really stem from the mid 16th century onward. Uh, I prefer the term Ottomanizing. Uh, <clears throat> there isn't really anything that most people would recognize as Ottoman in quotes, uh, ex in existence, uh, as uh, or at least you know fully formulated and sort of consolidated uh, at the time of the construction of the uh, or compilation and construction of the inventory. The I think it's also important to so going going back to Amasya and to Bayezid II uh, in terms of certainly book production, utilization, cultural orientation, and indeed cultural experimentation. Uh, you know, with the I mean, as Ferenc Sirkes in in his contribution to our volume. Uh, points out quite uh, quite aptly. <clears throat> there is so little Turkish material uh, in the, the collection of divans and uh, and the like to which uh, Atufi turns his attention. That in a period of growing interest in the utilization of Turkish, or even the development, which will come really several decades later, uh, of a distinctly West Turkish Ottomanizing or finally Ottoman uh, language uh, of the court. And Ferenc you know, points out that one of the secondary functions of the inventory may have been to precisely take stock of, you know, what there was in terms of, you know, not just generally poetic production uh, represented in, in the library, but specifically uh, what there was in Turkish. And as Gudru has pointed out too, there isn't all that much. Well, I, <clears throat> which relates also to Jemal's discussion of uh, of Ottomanist teleologies, because crud crudely put, uh, certainly an earlier generation or two of Ottomanists, and <clears throat> two generations ago, there weren't very many Ottomanists around. Uh, the ambient uh, or dominant assumption was well if it's about ottoman history uh it must be in turkish so one of the things that uh, but you know for two centuries after 1300 there isn't much turkish there just is apart from uh you know works uh collected uh, in in Chagatai, which was becoming 
a at the hands of the likes of Ali Shir Nabawi, uh, a a language of culture and intellectual production, but located, uh, of course, at the uh, at the still Timurid court uh, of Sultan uh, Hussein Baikara uh, in Herat. So the, the the linguistic component, uh, I think, of the the whole project uh, becomes very clear. That is of Bayezid and Atufi's project uh, becomes very clear when one looks at when one is able to look at the not just the individual sections of the inventory, but actually. It, it's it's totality okay. because it is a kind of stock taking but ultimately a totalizing uh project of accumulation and construction i will also i just want to add as jamal has or underline uh <clears throat> the developments of the very beginning of the 16th century uh, to which Jamal has alluded in particular, that is the question of the, the temporality of the inventory and what came after, as well as what came before. And my contention is, uh, no, this, <laughs> this cannot be considered an organic development. Uh, and that the world from which the inventory emerged was a very different one from the world that it would help to create in the 16th century. But that creation owed as much, of course, to the tremendous perturbations uh, in society, as well as linguistic and intellectual, cultural orientations uh, represented by the accession, by violent, me more or less violent means of Selim the uh, First, his designs on Chaldiran, and I've elsewhere argued that. The real problem was uh, between Selim and Ismail uh, was not who was orthodox, quote unquote, uh, on the basis of a purported strict divide between Sunni and Shi'i identity. The problem was rivalry over who could legitimately, legitimately be considered the Mahdi the Messiah, uh, divinely mandated uh, to set right the order of the world. Uh, but I'll only go touch on that tangentially, and I need to uh, sort of get on. Uh, okay. The... So what about that world of the 15th century? Uh, well, actually, the inventory also gives us considerable insight into that uh, and to try and, and try and encapsulate it in the inter interests of time. Uh, I'll just say that the classification of sciences to which my friends have uh, have alluded, that is the organization of sciences, uh, is not the more or less Avicenna one that would come to be classified in the later 16th century uh, as core or characteristic of Ottoman understandings of knowledge. Uh, it's quite different. And here I'll just turn to 
a figure in whom I've on whom I've been working off and on for quite some time, uh, named Abdurrahman al Bistami, uh, born in 1380 and died in 1454, a year after the Great Conquest. Uh, he was an well, he was he was an immigrant from Mamluk lands, uh, who had gone to Cairo after you know, the dis disastrous incursions, from a resident's perspective, disastrous incursions uh, of Tamerlane Timur okay, into northern Syria. Of course, in fourteen o two, famously, uh, you know. Uh, beating the tar out of teaching a lesson uh, to this upstart, the leader of this upstart principality that was making sort of imperializing moves under Bayezid the uh, First, you know, to to tell to tell him and the Ottomans that they needed to mind their own place in the hierarchy of sovereignty. Okay. Uh, that is, they might be, they might be able to call themselves sultans, and I won't go in unless, you know, what sultan really means uh, in this period. Uh, but they're certainly not khans. Okay. They can have no legitimate claims to universal you know, uh, universalist, uh, I suppose, imperial status. Uh, that is for the likes of Timur uh, and the little, uh, the little Mongol princes that he <laughs> keeps around him, uh, and seems to be uh, acting in in the name of. If Al Bistami. Uh, then he goes to Cairo. He clearly, among other people, hangs out a lot uh, with the great scholars or the great future scholars uh, of what would become Ottoman or Ottomanizing lands. Uh, and Bistami classifies himself as being uh, one, a Sufi, a mystic, uh, a believer in the mystical path, and two, Ahlul Harf, okay, a letrist. Now, this would seem, uh, and he does have an enormous classification of the sciences, that uh, 400 pages, uh, at least, that was composed for Murat II uh, in 1439, 1440. Uh, <laughs> well, to go back to to just a, a, a touch on a, a on a point that I alluded to earlier. So Atufi, uh, pardon me, Al Bistami wrote exclusively in Arabic, and a very elegant Arabic, uh, I might add. Uh, he was probably he also announces himself uh, a proud Sunni Hanafi, uh, and it was no doubt his Hanafi buddies from Cairo uh, you know, who sort of said, you know. Hey, come on up here and join us. Well, he <laughs> so he did, uh, and became friends. And even uh, in the case of one figure, Mullah Fenari, uh, <clears throat> whom Tash Kupruzade will later identify as sort of standing at the head of a specifically Ottoman lineage of scholarship uh, 
well, you know, kind of not so much when he doesn't like the way things are going. Uh, in Ottomanizing lands, he picks up and moves with all of his students and his books uh, where? To Karaman. Uh, and for a number of years, as yet, you know, not... I do actually have a student who's working on several students who are working on Mullah Fenadi. Anyway, uh, I'm sure they will be able to pin down when, how long and when he actually spent this time in Karaman. He was also a an interlocutor of a teacher too, and clearly a friend to uh, Sheikh Bedrettin. And there are indeed, <clears throat> I mean, after uh, after his execution in 1416, uh, of course, he, like a lot of other people, feels like he feels that he has to get out of town for a while, and he does go back to Mamluk lands for a bit, but ultimately comes back uh, and spends the last 30 years of his life uh, really, as the in Borsa, as the protege of Murat II, and for a year uh, of Mehmet II. Okay. It is to me notable that how many of his works, and many of them autographs, uh, if not holographs, and he was tremendously productive uh, in you know, purely numerical terms. Uh, well, he, <clears throat> anyway, <clears throat> these these copies uh, marked sometimes twice with the seal of Bayezid II, okay. uh, you know, indicate that his work was valued, uh, particularly in the time of Bayezid II, uh, although by the time he assumed the throne, if there really is a throne to be assumed, uh, figuratively speaking, uh, Al Bistami had been you know, dead for quite some for several decades, uh, and yet he lives on. And one place that he lives on, I believe. Uh, oh, sorry, one one last thing: his identification of letrism, al al khuruf, as both the source and the pinnacle of all intellectual and scientific endeavor okay. would seem to identify him uh, most closely or objectionably with, of course, the famous uh, Fazlullah of uh, Astarabad, who's the figure that we we think of most immediately when you mention the term Khorufi. Uh, well, you know, Bistami <clears throat> deals with that one pretty uh, succinctly in his classification of sciences uh, by twice denouncing Fazlullah uh, as one who has perverted a true path of learning in the interest of serving his own uh, worldly or carnal uh, interests. Uh, but on the other hand, Bistami made, make, makes it very clear that he identified with an international, uh, if we can use that term, an international brotherhood, a kind of republic of letters, if you will, uh, whom he identifies as Ikhwan al-Safa wa Khullan al-Wafa, the <clears throat> brethren of purity and the friends of fidelity. Now, the nomenclature, of course, goes all the way back to the 10th century and the famous 
uh, Ikhwan al-Safa of Basra and its uh, immediate uh, environs who, you know, are somewhat suspected of uh, uh, of having Ismaili connections, and I don't have time to go in uh, to go into that. It, <clears throat> but one of the things that, and the larger project, it's made it's quite clear uh, by, among others, uh, the work of Evrim Binbash, for example, who wrote a dissertation and a, a, a book uh, on one of the members of this brotherhood, uh, but this one in Timurid uh, rather than in more westerly geographies, which actually raises just one, one, one other, well, I'll get to that in, in a moment, and then I will shut up. Uh, The project of <clears throat> the Ikhwan al Safa, uh, which also included people like uh, Mullah Fenari, as <clears throat> <laughs> there's some great references to him in, in some of the some of the Timurid sources. Uh, <clears throat> was to conjoin you know, in an era that they identified as millennial. Okay. They deeply believed uh, in sort of the, the ultimate sort of, but not only in the legitimacy but the specialness of their own cultivation of learning, okay, number one. So it's really their generation or generations. Uh, and I, I would submit that the, uh, the Ikhwani ethos uh, actually endures you know, well into the at least the early 16th century, which is one reason that uh, even Tashka Prusada uh, and the like, among the compilers of biographical dictionaries, name him as, uh, as an important figure, even if they don't quite understand anymore what he was getting at, or they don't want to talk about it because of the negative and objectionable con connotations that that letrism uh, <clears throat> has accumulated. Now, what is it about the the, the Ikhwani project was to identify the millennial or messianic candidate for universal rule? but also to conjoin learning with sovereignty. Okay. So sovereignty without learning or recourse uh, to, you know, particularly these people, but also to their understanding, you know, of the nature of, the nature of science, the nature of cosmology. Uh, and finally, most most importantly, one of the, so there is a strong millennialist and messianic uh, vein uh, in this intellectual uh, current, uh, number one. Number two, it's, uh, <clears throat> they're extremely interested in history. In fact, Al-Bistami says very explicitly that it is history, that is sublunar terrestrial history and the history of uh, the comings and goings of not only polities, but also the births and deaths of 
preeminent men of learning. As marching together and defining the course, the cosmic course of history from, it could be either from the creation and from Adam, uh, or in some cases just the, uh, just focused on what will become the Ottoman lineage. Uh, it is history that represents the last phase of revelation. Right. And I, I do think it's hypothetical, I suppose, uh, but I think worth thinking about that the, the impact of such ideas, it certainly points to and may well have had something substantial to do with uh, the emergence out of not very much in terms of, you know, anything that we will come to call Ottoman and the fluorescence and deliberate cultivation of uh, a geographically and genealogically specific uh, lineage of learning. And we can see in Hatufi's inventory uh, from the positioning of certain branches of learning together uh, or next to or contiguously next to one another uh, that we can see Bistamis, the influence of Bistamis classification of sciences, which he encapsulated uh, in an image, if you will, that was still admired and considered very original uh, a century later, a, a century after his death, in the form of a tree <clears throat> with roots, trunk, branches, leaves, uh, and one of the really fascinating things uh, about his organization is that unlike the previously more or less standard uh, Avicenon, you know, and ultimately sort of victorious uh, Avicenon classification, which classifies Siesa sovereignty or rule uh, in its various forms <clears throat> with metaphysics. Okay. Whereas in the Avicennan model, it's simply one of the practical sciences. Okay. Uh, I mean, that's probably the most significant, I suppose, or, or uh, yeah, it's significant. And actually, <clears throat> again, goes to this uh, project, this millennialist project of the Brethren of Purity to effect a conjuncture uh, and, if you will, a kind of marriage or at least fraternal uh, relationship between learning and sovereignty. And we can see this, again, if one goes to for some of the earliest sources for at least 15th century uh, <clears throat> Ottomanizing things in the form of the takvims, the almanacs uh, that most recently uh, Tunshen, uh, our own Tunshen, uh, has uh, has written about, uh, we can actually see the construction okay, in the person and in the time of Murat II, so even before the conquest, uh, of uh, an, a universalist imperializing identity, and I say universalist in all in all senses, because the, the later representation 
uh, of the Ottoman house as the protector of all right religion, not just Islam, but also Christianity, Judaism, uh, what have you. You could go back uh, even further because one element of Bistami's classification of the sciences uh, is to establish the legitimacy together with specifically Islamic sciences uh, of non-Islamic but venerable Gnostic knowledge, okay? particularly knowledge of uh, cosmology, the development of the planetary spheres uh, and so on and so forth, uh, all the way down to the sublunar world and contemporary history. Uh, it's in the Takvims in which, you'll just have to take my word for this, the construction of the, the Takvims, which are usually in Persian uh, at this point, allows us to, uh, it, and in which Bistami played a key role in Bursa, uh, we can trace the active construction okay, of an image of the Ottoman ruler, uh, who, both as a patron of knowledge, as well as a political actor. Uh, <clears throat> as universal emperor, universal emperor of Islam, but also not only of Islam. And I don't have time to go into the, uh, uh, the partic uh, particularities. The <clears throat> so this was a vision that was being developed in the, say, you know, the middle of the, the 15th century, in the last years of, uh, of uh, Murat II. <clears throat> It was an ideological construction, but one that was intimately related to, or generated by, in fact, the larger project uh, of the Ikhwan. I should stop there. Uh, sorry to have rambled on, but thank you all so much for your patience. Uh, and thanks, of course, to my, my friends and colleagues for so ably preparing the way for my own ramblings. Um, at this point, um, after okay, um, at this point, after listening to uh, the three speakers, I would only like to remind the audience that uh, we owe this book and the contents of this book to the long-standing friendship and collaboration of these three distinguished scholars with very different interests and specialties in the Ottoman history of 15th and 16th centuries. Uh, well, I would like to open the floor to questions. Uh, to my surprise, at the moment, uh, we don't have many uh, questions but that, uh, <laughs> well, uh, that's, uh, that's only uh, shows, you know, how rich the, uh, the talks uh, were and people like me are speechless. So, <laughs> um, and uh, there's one question in Turkish and we have already decided to, uh, I mean, I, I can go back and ask this question, uh, but I would just also ask you, uh, you know, the three speakers, if you would like to add to, uh, you know, each other's uh, talks, uh, I mean, you are welcome at this point before 
So, uh, would you like to add or, you know, ask questions to one another? All right, then I would just proceed with the, there's one question uh, and it is Etrisia Dayini uh, who asks uh, if one were to use Ottomanizing in quotation marks during this period, then when did the concept of being Ottoman come about and what impact do modernization narratives have on this? I think either Jamal or Cornell uh, are asked this question. <laughs> Cornell, I think. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you, Jamal. Thank, thank you, Tulai. Uh, and indeed, I just saw the question on uh, uh, in uh, in the chat section, and I apologize for the noise in the background, but it's uh, the bi-monthly cleaning day in the Fleischer the Fleischer household, uh, <clears throat> and last chance before Christmas, and so on and so forth. Anyway. Uh, well, one one thing that I would would say about this uh, is that, and this again goes back to you know what we see in in the takvims, uh, but also in the works of Al Bistami, you know, who hasn't really received much attention uh, until the last decade or so. Uh, again, probably partly because he wrote com completely in Arabic. Uh, and also because he's considered something of a weirdo, okay, from that later sort of Ottoman perspective. You know, yeah, we know he was a great guy, but we don't know why he was such a great guy. Okay. Uh, I mean, the fact that, for example, uh, just in that part of the uh, the tree of sciences to which I al alluded that deals with siyasa, uh, with rule, uh, <laughs> later copyists, and by later I don't mean, I mean even later, late 16th century uh, copyists, uh, couldn't figure out what this was about. Okay. Why should sovereignty be associated, be placed in the category of metaphysics? And so Siasa, uh, for those of you know who know the uh, Arabic script, <clears throat> is very clear in the earliest manuscripts, uh, but in and the fact that there were so many copies of his works, indeed, adaptations into Ottoman Turkish into in the late 16th century. Uh, and it's really Al-Bistami who is, for, forms the uh, sort of foundation for that construction of the image of the Ottoman Sultan specifically, uh, either Selim the First or Suleiman, as the awaited Mahdi. That uh, a number of us, the late Barbara Fleming, uh, and I myself have uh, worked on fair, fairly fairly extensively. They couldn't recognize Siasa. They thought, you know, what the heck is Siasa doing here? Uh, and so they you know, often rendered Siasa as Se'a, the hour, meaning the last hour, because that sounds more metaphysical okay, than, than politics. Uh, or sometimes it's just a completely unrecognizable scrawl, which points to, uh, I hope this 
go some direct some, some ways toward answering the question uh that even to those people who would you know be the sort of creators of a canonized ottoman literary and scientific culture uh found the world of the 15th century the wor world of al-bistami not entirely recognizable you know, indeed the gentleman who was commissioned in 1597 to produce uh, an Ottoman version of one of the cent central works, the one which, uh, again, forms the uh, the core, the kernel of the development of the image of the Ottoman Sultan as messianic ruler, but also messianic savior uh, through the deployment of knowledge as well as po political power. Uh, he says at, at one point, well, you know, I'm, <clears throat> I was commissioned to do this because I have really good Arabic, but some passages I couldn't put into Turkish, uh, because I don't understand the science that underlies these things. So those, pa those passages, uh, he left in Arabic and marked in red. Okay. Uh, because he didn't want to risk uh, giving a mislead misleading uh, rendition. Uh, so I guess uh, succinctly, uh, mo most suc succinctly, you know, one, there was nothing inevitable uh, about the development out of the, uh, out of the library inventory uh, into you know, this imperial culture that really dates in its formation from the 16th century, the mid 16th century, and particularly from the the period of Sultan Suleiman, uh, as well as his immediate successors. Uh, there was nothing inevitable about it, okay? uh, but it's finally in the later 16th century that some decisions are made about what is appropriate to include or exclude from this new narrative uh, of an Ottoman state. The only, the uh, only other thing I would say about it uh, is that in the construction of this imperial identity, and this becomes very clear in the works of Bistami, uh, and in some of the, the titulature used in some of the takvims, eh, but it's particularly clear in Bistami's Arabic. Uh, you have to, you know, Ibn Uthman, Osmanullah, you know, the leader of a principality identified with a particular lineage, has to be, be given, you know, dynastic status. In other words, Ibn Uthman has to be made to become al Uthman, okay? the the Ottoman, uh, the Ot uh, Ottoman lineage, and again you can you can trace this uh, both through the Takvims and uh, uh, and and and in in the works of uh, of Al Bistami. It, just you know, find, finally, I would say that. Uh, Anyhow, my my my colleagues Kaya Shaheen, with whom I I wrote the uh, the essay on the historical section uh, of the inventory, and Tun Shen, with whom I wrote the book or pardon me the essay on uh, the astral sciences, uh, <clears throat> which is being cultivated sort of massively uh, in in the time by Bayezid II himself. Uh, <clears throat> I'm going with that one. Uh, agree, you know, that as I said, the the classification of sciences uh, here very different from earlier and later ones uh, is that is uh, in use and understood uh, is 
very probably because of the underlying uh, influence and importance of this you know, significantly different Eurasian uh, classifica classification of the sciences represented by Vistabi. All right, I'll stop there. Thank you. I think we can. Is uh, what was the extent of the Byzantine Greek manuscript collection in the palace library during Benedict II's reign compared to his father? Vigrovoja mentions in her chapter that some of the Byzantine relics had been sent to a friend in exchange for keeping Jem Sultan. But I wonder what was left in the library, if any. You, you, are, you are muted. I don't think we heard the beginning of what the question was. Uh, what was the extent of the Byzantine Greek manuscript collection in the palace library during Bezat II's reign? Compared to his father, Virruhoja mentions in her chapter that some of the Byzantine relics had been sent to friends in exchange for keeping Jem Sultan, but I wonder what was left in the library, if any. As far as we can tell, uh, the, these uh, Byzantine books were not catalogued, so uh, they may have been included in the 100 that are mentioned uh, later uh, in the inventories of Selim the First. But before that, uh, I have looked at library inventory. I mean, um, treasury inventories starting with the early earliest one from the 1490s, and uh, Several icons are mentioned, but no books are included, as far as I know. Okay. Um, our host Chidam Yildirim also has a question. Yeah. Uh, our host Chidam Yildirim also has a question. Uh, she asked uh, how uh, you can describe Aturki as a Sarai Kitupani just at that time. Um, uh, I, I'm not sure if I understand the question correctly. Why do we identify him as such? Or what was his, his exact role? <clears throat> In other words, he calls himself the uh, keeper of the books of the palace treasury. So she asked whether uh, can, can call him as a scientist. The keeper uh, of the books. Right. So he calls himself the keeper of the books of the palace treasury. Okay. I th I may, if I may. Oh, sorry. Please, Gildur. No, no, no, no. Just a word. I think it's probably in this context, it's worth mentioning. Uh, that he also identifies himself as having been the Muallimi Gulman. Okay, so okay. he is the teacher, uh, uh, if you will, of at the very least the the Gulman core in the palace. Uh, right. And so that he had to, he had experience okay, with the problem, if you will, which was not nearly as big a problem uh, at this point as uh, many of our Ottomanist colleagues have uh, <clears throat> depicted it as being, of absorbing uh, formerly non Muslim uh, elements into. The ruling elite. Okay. So I think that this is uh, yet another important dimension of Atulfi's identification 
with palace service. And again, I think goes does point back uh, to the to Arbistami's <clears throat> Brethren of Purity project. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> to conjoin sovereignty with learning, okay. Okay. Uh, uh, one thing, if I may, and before this, I wrote a biography of Atufi to the degree I could gather from all the crumbs of information. He was also the librarian of the treasury of Chandarli Ibrahim Pasha wherein he contributed his own. So I, I imagine in 1499, when Chandarli Ibrahim Pasha dies, he joins palace service, first as Muallimi Gulman, as Cornell said. And during that time, he familiarizes himself specifically with the palace library, though in terms of his learning, it must have come before, as Cornell said, on, of, of familiarity with all different kinds of learning, non-Muslim, or uh, different branches of sciences. Chandali Ibrahim Pasha was an avid book collector and patron of books himself. So, and, and probably had inherited at least some part of the Chandali family library collection. So this, this is no mean job that he held before he joined the palace service. And in palace, while Muallimi Gilman, he also was tasked with this uh, with this uh, specific commission. And that is, at least then, he calls himself uh, as the keeper of the Hazine or Hazane. Uh, the full title he gives himself is the He gives his family background and everything. Uh, his own books are listed in the palace library, of course. There's so much to say about him as a character. <laughs> if, because of the pandemic, I couldn't go visit his village. His village between Merzifon and Amasya is worth a visit because of, I put it in a footnote. There's a very specific question about him and his family that I cannot resolve without going there. And I postponed it because of the pandemic. but. It's in the it's in a long footnote, my question. Yes. Can you please repeat your question here? Sorry? Can you please repeat the question? Uh, the one that you put in a footnote? No, it has to do with the fact that his uh... <laughs> man, that's a that's a big one. I don't know if you really want me to get into the village. Uh, associated with him is named Hayruddin. His full name was Hayruddin Huzar Atufi. Oh. And the next village is named after his son. And both of the villages are uh, Alevi villages. Mm -hmm. And and in his, in his Waqf document, his sister is called Kutlumelek. Mm -hmm. I mean, for those who study those traditions, there are enough tantalizing references here to look into for further clarification. I have some thoughts, but this is the line of exploration. Okay, okay. thank you, thank you, Jamal. So uh, in two hours, uh, <laughs> but very quickly, but uh, we are nearing the end. I congratulate the editors and the contributors once again on this groundbreaking study. Uh, which will continue to inspire scholars, generations of scholars, Ottomanists and others, uh, for many decades to come. Uh, thank you, Guru, uh, Jamal, Cornell, for this feast of a book, really a reminder of a true joy of learning. So yes, as Guru said, we are this bookish, you know, bookworms, bookish people, <laughs> So uh, get Im also, also immense, immense uh, joy out of uh, anything related to books. But uh, thanks to you, uh, I mean, uh, the inventory of art of uh, also, uh, you know, contributed to 
our uh, pleasures in, in learning. And thank you all to the organizers of this event and to the audience. Uh, I will now pass the floor to Iremina. Thank you. I would like to thank you very much, all of you, for this wonderful talk. Um, <clears throat> I'm sorry. Dear listeners, also thank you for your questions. Uh, it is always nice to have such uh, an interest from the uh, audience. Uh, Anamet Library Talks will continue in 2023. Uh, I would like to say that we will share our yearly program soon. Uh, so keep in touch to follow up uh, the 2023 talks. Uh, uh, once again, I uh, thank you very much to accept our invitation and for this wonderful talk. Uh, good evening. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank Bye -bye. you. Thank you all. <laughs>